for this week on Reimagining Education. I was excited to ask Sherry Cohen and Cynthia DeWint to join us because they were in Learning Creative Learning the first time and then we learned at the beginning of Learning Creative Learning 2 that they had been taking the ideas and really running with them and taking them in directions that I had never imagined. So we wanted to share that as inspiration for others to take the ideas and run with them. And I also asked Rick Rose Roque to join us since she was part of the planning and running of Learning Creative Learning 1. And she thinks a lot about running workshops, so I thought she could have some good questions for us and perspective on this. So I thought we'd dive in, maybe taking us back to last year, Sherry, you posting in the forums that you weren't sure how to apply the ideas from Learning Creative Learning one and how they applied to your work in human rights work. So could you say a little bit about that? Um, yeah, I remember when I got the invitation or someone had passed it to me like this LCL one was happening, I, I got very excited about just, you know, reading the blurb about it. It sounded something really interesting. And I think the first um, the first couple of sessions um, felt more about like learning creative learning and then it kind of went more into the digital realm which is not really where I work so I felt like you know oh like my enthusiasm started to like plummet and I thought is this about computers because if it's about computers I don't know what I'm going to get out of this but the first cu couple of, of sessions were so inspiring that I just kind of stuck with it and it just so happened that I had invited another colleague Cynthia DeWint to join me um, we're both in the we work in the international relief and development sector and so and so we started you know batting about ideas and suddenly we like slowly bit by bit started kind of taking little building blocks of LCL1 and figuring out how they fit into the puzzle of, of where we work. Cynthia, what do you remember about starting to get involved in the process? Well, I got like, excited. I'm I'm not very good with computers at all. So I, but I thought I have to venture. So I even tried my hand at Scratch. But as I was trying, and I love the spaghetti challenge. And um, so uh, the learning by doing, I was very excited. And then listening to the stories of the different speakers. And then what I looked at is the word principles that apply to working with adults, which is what a lot of time I spend doing. Um, and so for me, it was like, oh, yes. Um, uh, building the prototype. Okay, I can see that. <laughs> I didn't manage to build a prototype, but I could see where the the workshops that we normally do could be seen as prototype. And I had made a pledge when all of us consultants in this field got together that I wanted a different way to design my workshops. Yeah, and so with with Shari, it was like, oh, I have a buddy and we can try these things out um, even though it was not in the digital field but the principles apply to learning and I'm all for that. <laughs> We've both been consultants for UN agencies and international NGOs and we had all these worksheets and we had all these PowerPoints and we would just basically spend a week here's, you know, here's the next session, here's a bunch of PowerPoints, here's the concepts, here's the worksheets that go with it and so the filling out of the worksheets was the participatory part, but I was starting to realize like there was just something intrinsically missing. There was like it was like a puzzle, and some of the key pieces were not there. And then I met Cynthia um, through a group of consultants who are also doing social and behavior change. And um, you know when we started taking the LCL one, I think we both started having like personal little aha moments firing off like after every class. If we take this and we put it in here, and we kind of like mix it around in our, as Cynthia calls it, our cosmic kitchen, and we, you know, <laughs> create something different with the same ingredients, what, what would it look like to, to our work? And I'll pass it on to Cynthia to carry on. <laughs> well, I, I think that um, the cosmic kitchen, mixing things up, which, which was, even though I didn't manage to do anything with Scratch, what got to me was, they were building blocks. And if I took my the outline of like a, a capacity building workshop and think of the elements as building blocks, and then how could we make them as exciting that people would share, people get their aha, the different 
elements that we now see in in this um, you know in terms of that it's a project that you have other people that you play with it and that you know you share it and then you try it again so these elements as you know let's apply them <laughs> which is what Shari and I have been doing for example the, the modes of participation was basically me looking at a PowerPoint, which was this you know nifty animated PowerPoint. You would click a button, and a new row would zoom onto the screen, and it was all very nifty. But um, when we used it the first time around as a PowerPoint, it was just a lot of information for people to take in. And so I stared at that thing for hours, and all of a sudden I realized, oh, I can deconstruct this and make it into a game. And, um, each each row was a different color, uh, which coordinated with a different component of a mode of, of um, participation, which is a, a human rights-based approach at looking at whether we are engaged in tokenistic participation or full empowered people, you know, doing it by and for themselves participation. And much of development is still the tokenistic part, quite frankly. So it it was a really important concept to get across, and. Um, we basically just, you know, created this table game where we would give each of the tables layer at a time. It was a, it was a dialogue process of just, you know, dis discussing and hashing out and moving these different squares around. And it was a different type of learning. And it's one of the sessions that in the anonymous online evaluations that we do after each event, it's one of the sessions that gets the highest marks and people saying, you know, that was really like a deep learning moment for me because I realized that I was, uh, like someone in Nepal recently just said, I realized that I thought I was actually being participatory, but I actually was really being tokenistic with my, with my uh, counterparts in the community, and I had no idea I was being tokenistic. I thought I was being rights-based. Mm -hmm. And that kind of like aha moment just to have through a game wasn't coming through in a PowerPoint presentation. On the same thing with participation, we have communicato um, participatory communication and non-participatory communication. Again, beautiful slide sets and PowerPoints. And then one day, I looked. I was looking at it, and then I found video clips of Alvin Ailey. You know, um, it was an ad for their new season, and, and I found one that reminded me so much of participatory communication and the uh, another one that reminded me of non-participatory communication so we thought maybe and they are only like two minutes yeah after dealing with a lot of the concepts and people have been talking so then we said okay we're going to show a video and you tell us which of these two videos remind you of the concepts that we've been talking about in participatory and non-participatory communication well, the way people used the concept was so striking. Some of the comments they make, and then still people had doubts. Like, um, but after discussing all of that, non-participatory communication is good, no? So then we asked, would you live in a country that has non-participatory communication? And that, you know, it became very clear. Nobody wanted to live in that country. <laughs> so I think by addressing the feeling emotions and people putting themselves in the place and using films, using games, I think it draws people into the concept in a way that only talking about it wouldn't do. The agenda for the five days that you have that it's this very visual beach scene with different umbrellas mm -hmm. and things, <laughs> could you say a little bit about how that came about? And I'll let Cynthia touch on that, that's her thing. <laughs> Um, I liken the, the learning events to going on a journey. And so like in Zanzibar, we thought the journey is that we saw around us was people walking on the beach, going from one place to the next. And also in Zanzibar, it, the, it's known for special Zanzibar doors. So for me, it was it's walking on the beach and going to a door that opened new possibilities. So um, each day was a beach umbrella, and we collected sand from the beach and put it in the, in the footsteps to bring the flavor of the place and that people could relate to because they are in a new place. And if we could say that every day took us from one place to the next, so we would call, give every day a theme, and it was like to entice people to move away 
to start moving from where they started and end up in a new place. We try to have the day and the place inspire us and hopefully that also comes across um, inviting the learners to participate, to go on a journey. Did you say at the beginning they tell the story of their project to each other and they can use different medium, they can tell a story, or is that what it was yeah. at the beginning? Yes, yeah. they, create, they create a poster. On day one in the morning we have what's called a project share fair. And it's so that everybody um, can understand what everyone else's projects and the first time we did it we were just really stunned at the level of creativity. I mean mm -hmm. we had our partners in Ghana were like, we brought things like crepe paper and one of my colleagues said um, this is the most tricked out art supplied workshop I've ever been to. And I said, it's not a workshop, it's a learning event. And um, you know, we bring all kinds of stuff, you know, glitter pens and crepe paper and stickers and you name it, it's there. People make like they make the share fair posters, you know, and we ask them, you know, it's a visual representation of your of, of what you're doing. So we ask them to like tell us what is the project, like what's it supposed to be? What are you most proud of about the project? And then what are the key successes? Because sometimes what you're most proud of is different from the successes. And then we ask them, what are your barriers, your challenges, you know, I mean, your failures? And we talk about having like a specific failure fair um, at some point. We haven't done a full failure fair. But what we do is we encourage them in a nurturing and in a safe way so that it's okay for them to say this particular thing is not working so well. And one of the guiding questions we ask is, ask us a question. Ask us as a group of co-learners, of co think of us all as co-consultants to each other for the week. What would you like help on? Is there a question or an issue you want us to help you answer? Um, and we'll try to work together on that on the side during the week. So they present this on day one and then we, we sort of bookend it with day five in the morning. They create their next steps roadmap, is, which is to basically map out what they're already doing in key milestone markers and then take what they learned about social change and behavioral change and add into it things that are, we ask them to like denote what things can you add in, like what principles and processes that are no cost that you can do right now forever. What things are low cost that maybe if you move some budget things around or you incorporate something into an existing you know, event you can get that done and then what things do you want to work on that you need additional funding for and so we ask them to really think about, it becomes about what have you really learned and what's important to you. So you mentioned there was a survey that you gave them at the end but uh, during the workshop and after the workshop, um, how do you know how things are going for the participants? Are there certain signs that you look for, um, things that you ask yourself to understand how it went? Actually, what we ask is that they do it. So on the first day of the workshop when we're setting the, um, we're asking people what are the norms for learning and what group agreements they can make to make it a learning full event for them. We make a sign up sheet so people can be eyes, ears or guardians of the process. And these people that select, every day we have different sets of eyes, ears and guardians. They sit in in the evening planning session when we reflect on the day and look at the, the day ahead. So at that point it's very raw in front of us like this was good, this wasn't good, this we like, um, we want more of this, um, can we spend more time outside, um, can we have more time for discussions, can we change groups, so all kind of requests to make it more relevant for their way of learning according to the norms that they set and agreed upon in the beginning. Yeah, do you want to say a little bit more, either one of you, about why and how you started to tinker with the workshops that you do? To me it, it was often when I got stuck with one of the things. For example, I wanted to do something with the Makey Makey and I'm <laughs> like, oh no, I don't have enough background or computer skills or anything like that. But then the, just the fact that they could take a banana or Play-Doh to do something, <laughs> that was an aha for me to use Alvin Ailey movie to show or ask questions about participatory or non-participatory communication. Mm -hmm. So it's more by analogy mm -hmm. and I think also it's, um, for example, the, the, um, the childhood um, items mm -hmm. and for me it's like, oh, 
so anything can go. It's what what's important to the person learning. So asking the questions more about symbolic things. Mm -hmm. And to me, working at the symbolic level allows you to go to the heart. So we were before working only head and hands, we were looking for ways to bring the heart in. And so we designed different sessions that we could say, okay, does this have hand? Does it have heart? Does it have head? Okay. So it it it, it addresses the whole person. And I think all in all we wanted the learning to be deeper and we wanted it to address the whole person. And going back to the fact that you're at MIT, this institution that has this whole lore around it, and it's like, okay, if you can do it there, why can't we do it wherever we are working? How do we break that quality to the whole person wherever we receive them, be it in Zanzibar, be it in Nepal or Bangladesh? So it's to, to address the whole learner. And I think one of the most important things that we're finding is that this approach transcends educational level, economic, you know, socioeconomic status. It doesn't matter whether you come from a small village in Nepal or a big city in urban West Africa. There's something that equalizes about this whole thing, and I think that it's it's because of this sort of um, this equation that we have, which is you know the the H plus H equals H is head plus heart equals hands, which translates into, um, you know, knowledge is in your head, um, feeling is in your heart, and action is what comes out of you through your hands, through whatever you do. And so when we make sure that we, we complete the equation, so to speak, um, in each kind of like modular session that we're working on, great things happen. And whatever we're doing the underlying sort of concept, concept behind it is, is allowing people from many different cultures and backgrounds to have similar transformational experiences, which is really the coolest thing about the whole thing.